Hi everybody, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Mina Balasubramanian, who is going to do our, our talk today on autism. She's going to be talking about the genetics of autism. Uh, and Mina is a consultant clinical geneticist at the Children's Hospital. She works with a lot of paediatric genetic cases, um, and autism is quite common within that. So I'm really excited to hear about the talk she's going to give, basically talking about the latest research findings in terms of the gen genetics of autism. She's also able to stay uh, after the talk for the coffee, so if there are any uh, questions you might have for her, then she's going to be able to stay, which is fantastic, because I actually collaborated a little bit with some, on some research with Mina, and I know that she is super busy in terms of her uh, clinical load, so it's really great that she's been able to come and, and talk to us today. So. Um, uh, I'll leave the thoughts to Mina and I hope you all enjoy the talk. Thank you. you haven't given her any talk yet. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that introduction, Liz, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Can you all hear me? I'll try and be a bit more loud. Hang on, let me close the mic, might not be on. Right, so I'm here to talk about the complex genetics of autism spectrum disorders. And what I've tried to do is subdivide the talk into quite a few sessions, um, basically an introduction, including a masterclass in genetics, everything you ever needed to know about genes and chromosomes. Um, answer the very important question, or try and answer the very important question, is autism genetic? Try and distinguish between syndromic and non-syndromic autism. And of course, in clinical genetics practice, what we often come across is syndromic autism, so I'll be touching upon that more here. Uh, talk a bit about autism presenting with intellectual disability. Some of the conditions that we see in association with autism, uh, including <coughs> copy number variants, CNVs, single gene disorders that we see. Um, talk a bit about the latest research and some genetic advances in the field, and hopefully finish it all off with a summary. So by way of introduction, what I'd say is autism plus, so autism with other presenting features, is quite a common referral that we see in pediatric genetic services. However, it's often a very heterogeneous condition, and it's very seldom a pure diagnosis. So very rarely do we see just the non-syndromic autism. There's often other things going on. So it's complicated by what's happening in the family history, environmental interactions, what's the prior knowledge, etc. And in these situations, clinical genetics input is requested to try and tease out what's happening and can we come up with a unifying genetic diagnosis. So over the next few slides, I'm going to try and provide you a master class in genetics. So we start with the very basics, which is our body is made up of billions of cells, which are the building blocks to our body. And we draw a cell as a circle with a black blob in the middle called the nucleus. When you look down the nucleus, you'll see lots of little structures, what are referred to as chromosomes. Now, they all look jumbled up when you look down the microscope, but what the lab have kindly done is neatly rearranged them into pairs for us. So you start with chromosome 1, which is your longest pair, and then you work your way down to chromosome 22, which is your smallest pair. And then we have a pair of sex chromosomes at the end. So males or men have an X and a Y chromosome, while females or women would have two X chromosomes. Now it's important to remember this, of course, because in the context of the talk, you'd find that lots of the genes <coughs> that affect intelligence development sit on the X chromosome. And of course, males just have one copy of the X chromosome. Now all of these come in pairs because you inherit one copy from mother and one copy from father. Now, if you unwind these chromosomes, you basically get a long piece of string, along which sits about 20,000 pairs of genes. And again, they come in pairs because they inherit one copy from mother and one copy from father. Now, we're not able to look at each and every individual gene when we look down the microscope, but this is what it would look like. And these genes are um, specific instructions to produce a specific protein, which has a specific function in the body. But of course, as you can imagine, there's quite a few steps between the gene and the protein production. So if we go back and look at the structure of the DNA again, it's made up of several bases, which are designated by four different letters, A, D, G, and C. 
Now, a section of this DNA code that has the start signal and the stop signal and in between is referred to as the gene. But as you can imagine, there's quite a few steps between the gene and the protein. So what happens is the DNA code transcribes for an RNA, which is then translated into a protein, a specific amino acid, that links up together to form the protein. So this is how our gene sequence, for example, would look like. It's read three bases at a time. So you'd say AAA, GAC, CCC, and so on it goes. And each of these three repeats would encode for a specific amino acid. So what happens is this is the DNA code that encodes for a specific RNA, which then encodes for a specific <coughs> amino acid. And these amino acids link up together to form the amino acid chain, which ultimately forms the protein. And that has a specific function in the body. But of course, what's important to point out is that not all changes in the DNA sequence are disease-causing. So why would that be the case? So here in this table, you can see an example where this particular DNA sequence, GGC, encodes for a specific amino acid called glycine. But what if there's an alteration? So you have a situation where there's GGG, so the C is being changed to a G, but it still encodes for the same amino acid glycine. So that's something to remember that not all changes in the DNA sequence have an effect on the protein or have a meaningful effect on the protein. And again, similarly, you can see that there are three different stop codons here, or stop signal, UAA, UAG, UGA. So there could be an alteration, but it may not have an effect. And that is why we all carry certain changes within our DNA sequence, but it wouldn't have an effect on the phenotype. Now going back to this gene sequence again, as, as I said, you read it three bases at a time, AAA, GAC, CCC, and so on. So here's a very simple instruction the old man saw the cat. Now that's well understood and you know what that means. But of course what happens if there is an alteration? So if a base is added, if a base is lost, if it's duplicated, if the stop codon is introduced quite prematurely into this process, if there's an inversion, if there's a substitution, all of these change the instruction. So this is all it takes in some sense to cause a phenotype. So having talked about genes and chromosomes and what these alterations in, the, in DNA sequence might mean, I'm moving on to talk about the different patterns of inheritance that we come across in clinical genetics practice. So there's the Mendelian inheritance, which is passed down the generation, which we talk about autosomal and sex linked, as well as dominant versus recessive inheritance patterns. And then there's the non-Mendelian inheritance, which is perhaps slightly more important in the context of autism. So there's imprinting, mitochondrial inheritance, multifactorial, and mosaicism. So first talking about the Mendelian patterns of inheritance, the first thing we uh, discuss is the autosomal dominant inheritance. This is where it's passed down the generation, so vertical transmission. Both males and females are equally affected, and the recurrence risk is up to 50% or 1 in 2. So why would that happen? Here we have a situation where a parent carries a dominant faulty copy of the gene, which is dominating over the other copy and causing symptoms in this parent. When they go on to have children, they can either pass on the dominant faulty copy of the gene or the normal copy. But as you can imagine, if the parent passes on their faulty copy, then the child's got the condition, and if not, then they don't have the condition. So it's 50-50. And this would be regardless of the birth order or the sex of the child. And the risk would be the same for pregnancy. But of course, there are certain exceptions to the rule. So where we think that this is a dominant disorder, there may be no family history. And that could be because of de novo mutations, or so-called new mutations that have started for the first time in the child. Or there could be variable penetrance. So it might, it might be the same gene pool, but in different members of the family they might be affected to a different extent. Or there could be variable expression, meaning different members of the family that carry the same gene fold might exhibit the features in different organs, so to speak. So those are the um, exceptions to autosomal dominant 50-50 rule. <coughs> and then, of course, you can have gonadal mosaicism. So here's a situation where it appears that the child is the first person affected in the family. Parents are clinically unaffected. But when you talk about recurrence risk, we've got to remember that it is possible that a small proportion of the germ cells, so-called sperms or eggs, might contain the mutation without it being present in the rest of them. 
and hence there's a much higher recurrence risk than 0%. And this is something we do come across quite a lot in clinical practice. So that's autosomal dominant inheritance. Now moving on to autosomal recessive inheritance. This is a situation where both parents are heterozygous or so-called healthy carriers of the condition, so do not manifest features themselves. But when it comes to their pregnancy, there's a one in four chance, or 25%, of them passing it on to any children they have. So here you have both parents who are so-called healthy carriers of the condition, so it doesn't have an effect on their own health. But when it comes to their pregnancies, they can either pass on the normal copy or the one with the variation in it. And so as you can see, it's a one in four, or 25% chance. And again, it doesn't matter the sex of the child or the birth order. And as you can see, there's a two in three carrier risk for unaffected siblings. Usually we say it's a lower risk for children of the affected person, because they're all going to be carriers, but whether they have children with the condition would depend on their partner's carrier status. And also the risk would depend on population carrier frequency. So for example, cystic fibrosis, you've probably heard of that. So in the North European population, 1 in 25 people carry the Delta F508 variant, which we know confers a higher risk within the population. And of course, the risk would be higher in consanguineous families because they come from the same ancestry. And then moving on to X-linked inheritance. This is where genes are carried on the X chromosome. And if you remember me saying, because males or boys have just one copy of the X chromosome, that manifest features of the condition, whereas women would more generally tend to be carriers. So may, more males than females are affected. Females are generally carriers and so-called healthy carriers, so shouldn't manifest features of the condition. And of course, when they go on to their progeny risk, 50% of sons would be affected, 50% of their daughters would be carriers of the condition. And all daughters of affected males are carriers, but all their sons should be unaffected because they receive their X chromosome from the mother and uh, none of the offsprings of affected males should have the disorder. Again, we need to think about possibility of new mutations, organizer mosaicism risk. And the woman's carrier status or phenotype would very much be influenced by X inactivation. So why would that be? Um, that's because in each of the cells in a woman, there are two X chromosomes, but the cells just function on the one X chromosome, <coughs> the other remains dormant. And this is quite random, so there's supposed to be random X inactivation. But if there is a gene that's at fault, let's say, on the X chromosome, then the cells might choose to function on the normal X and make the one with the fault in it dormant. So there's supposed to be skewed X inactivation. But if that doesn't happen normally, then you might have a situation where females would also manifest features of the condition, perhaps to a milder extent. So we've talked about the Mendelian patterns of inheritance. Um, but then moving on to the other non-Mendelian patterns of inheritance, um, one thing that's perhaps slightly more important in the context of autism is multifactorial, where there's a combination of genetic and environmental factors which are having a role. So here are some examples of multifactorial inheritance. And then we go on to talk about epigenetic mechanisms. Here is a situation where phenotypic traits are, that are affected by the exposure to environmental or external factors would have a role. Now, epigenetic modifications change the gene expression patterns, but doesn't change the primary DNA sequence, so there's no mutation as such seen. <coughs> and some of the epigenetic mechanisms we know of include DNA methylation, histone modification, RNA silencing, etc. But this is a situation where they could be switching on or off of the genes, and epigenetic mutations that result in ASD would very much depend on the parent of origin, so whether it's maternally inherited or paternally inherited matters. So then we go on to talk about the imprinting or imprinted genes. So these imprinted genes only form a small proportion of the total gene complement, but these genes are significant because they're only active when inherited from one parent, monoallelic, so to speak. And this is always dictated at the time of um, gametogenesis, so the, during the production of the sperm or the egg. And as I said earlier, they're regulated according to the parent of origin. So an imprinted gene may be paternally expressed and maternally imprinted, so, so to say silenced or vice versa. It's always thought that there needs to be a good interplay between these paternally expressed genes and maternally expressed genes because the theory is that the paternally expressed genes try to promote fetal growth because it's a reflection of how mature the male is. Whereas the um, 
maternal express genes try to diminutive fetal growth because it's much easier for childbirth and to manage the child thereafter. And there needs to be a balance between these two genes. When that goes wrong, you end up with conditions that affect fetal growth and development. So there are several phenotypes that exist. Uh, you've probably heard of conditions like Russell Silver syndrome, Beckwith Wiedemann syndrome, which are complete opposites of each other, um, UPD14, etc. And the maternally inherited duplication on 15Q11, Q13 is um, one example of ASD due to an imprinted gene. So then we move on to the important question, is autism genetic? <coughs> and I think there's a big body of evidence now to suggest that it is, or definitely plays a big role. And what's the evidence to support this? Um, we know that there is recurrence in families, especially when they have a child with ASD, and the risk goes up if they have more than one child affected with ASD, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, multiple twin studies have shown higher concordance rates of ASD amongst monozygotic twins. And the fact that there's a high male to female ratio, suggesting that at least some of the genes that causes autism sit on the X chromosome. So this is some layers of evidence suggesting that autism is genetic. But of course, genetics of autism is interesting because it's been quite heterogeneous and there have been several studies over the last few decades trying to find consistent areas of interest, consistent list of genes that causes autism. But no two, no two studies have been exactly reproducible. So there have been no consistent genomic areas of interest identified through these studies. And we've identified hundreds of variants um, that are never replicated in another study or only partially replicated in another study. And what we say is genetic etiology can be identified in about a quarter of um, patients with ASD. And this would be higher if they had a syndromic ASD or an autism plus referral. And establishing the genetic diagnosis would very much be based on what the initial referral reasons are. <coughs> and again, autism presenting with intellectual disability, we're more likely to identify a unifying genetic diagnosis. Uh, this is because it's often associated with other things such as facial dysmorphology, congenital anomalies, a contributory significant family history, etc. And of course, as you'd imagine, these are the families that tend to get referred to clinical genetics more promptly. And what we then, what we then do is see them in the clinical genetics um, and undertake a dysmorphology examination or assessment. So moving on to what we actually do in a genetics clinic try and break the myth. Um, we try and ascertain the genetic diagnosis and clarify the inheritance pattern, undertake a dysmorphology assessment, and where possible, direct appropriate gene testing or genetic <coughs> testing. Um, when we do make a diagnosis, we try and explain the diagnosis and provide prognostic information to the family, provide them in um, contact with patient support groups, discuss various options available, including options during a pregnancy, and refer to appropriate specialists. Because often, as you can imagine, these conditions are quite rare and there's not a lot of literature. So we might be the only people who um, will know a little bit and at least then we have to refer them to the appropriate specialist. So I keep me uh, mentioning the word dysmorphology. What is that? Um, it was a term coined by David W. Smith in, in the 1960s to describe the study of normal morphology. And any deviation from the norm was said to be dysmorphology. What's important to remember is that this can be very subjective and it always amazes me how in our clinical meetings we're showing photographs of patients we've taken and we might say these are the clinical features or facial features and a colleague might disagree and say no, the child looks completely normal according to them. Also think of spectrum of normality. So there are um, features such as epicanthic folds, 2, 3, 2 syndactyly, which are just a deviation of the norm. So we need to know what's normal before we try and study what's not. Um, and what we often say in dysmorphology assessment is a picture can paint a thousand words. So we rely quite heavily on taking clinical photographs with appropriate informed consent, because um, that's the big, uh, a big part of our clinical practice. So how do we try and make a diagnosis in dysmorphology? Basically, we use two different approaches. Um, one is gestalt recognition. So this is based on the fact that we've already seen children with a particular condition, so let's say fragile X syndrome. We know what the um, family history would be like, or have a faint idea of what the family history would be like, what the child's physical features are like. There could be a behavioral gestalt, so there could be 
aggressive or they could be very uh, polite, very friendly behavior. So there's all, all these things that we try and recognize as soon as a child walks into clinic. Or there could be so-called Sherlock Holmes approach where there's quite a lot of investigative workup trying to piece together the family history, the family pedigree, detailed medical history, look at the child um, and see if we can put all this information together. And of course, as you can imagine, this is often used in conjunction with each other and then you help that with um, genetic investigations and use databases such as the London Dysmorphology Database, Phase 2 Gene, etc. It's quite a lot of online tools coming up now as well that we're able to access. So the dysmorphic examination is essentially a head-to-toe examination, but we're placing particular emphasis on things such as the head, size, shape, what the face, facial features are like, um, mouth, not to forget teeth, um, etc. Also look at the skeletal proportions, um, focus on the palmar and plantar creases, so the creases across the uh, palms. Skin stigmata, are there any specific um, skin signs? So there could be multiple cafe au lait patches, suggestive neurofibromatosis type 1 ash leaf macules, which are hypopigmented patches in tuberous sclerosis, etc. We always remind ourselves to look at the genitalia because that can sometimes carry important clues to a diagnosis. And then, of course, as I said, we try and direct appropriate genetic testing. Um, so the million dollar question is which gene do we go for? What sort of test do we do? And generally, we do the basics, which is the microarrays under the circumstances. So genetic testing is a minefield in itself. It's, uh, we have to make a lot of discussions around what is the condition, can the diagnosis be made clinically, is a genetic test available in the first instance because not all genes are known, we are not able to offer genetic testing um, for all the genes in the literature and this is important, there's a big gap between what happens in the research world and what's available in service. So although there is a paper out there that talks about a specific gene associated with ASD, autism, that testing may not always be, be available to us. And the research labs may not want samples from clinicians. So there is a big gap. And again, what type of test is it? Is it a diagnostic test trying to prove a diagnosis, a carrier to find out parents' carrier status for future reproductive risk? Is it predictive to see if an um, individual is at risk of developing a particular genetic condition? And the other thing we place quite a lot of focus on is consent. Is this full and informed consent? Have the family thought about who else the test result might affect? Um, particularly testing of children and adults with learning difficulties can be a minefield. Are there any other implications such as employment insurance? And of course, who's paying for the test? Because genetic test still remains quite expensive. We're talking of thousands. So it's who pays for that particular test. But of course, there are a multitude of reasons why genetic testing uh, would happen. Of course, to make an accurate diagnosis, provide management advice, are there any therapeutic options that are worth exploring? It helps the families to advance the understanding of the condition, opens up extended family testing, um, as well as options during the pregnancy by clarifying recurrence risk and providing options for testing during the pregnancy. So there's several reasons why genetic testing would be the thing to go for. And of course, I touched upon types of genetic testing. Um, we do not get involved with paternity testing or genetic fingerprinting. That's not our area. We're purely focused on genetic testing for diagnostic carrier or predictive status. Now, just briefly talking about the technology timeline, if you look at this, um, Watson and Crick first described DNA in the 1950s. And the last 60 to 70 years, genetics has moved on, initially quite slowly, but over the last decade, quite rapidly. And now we talk quite a lot about microarrays, um, which is a genome-wide scan, essentially. And then whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing, which has revolutionized our understanding of genes and genetics. So when you look at the pickup rates, um, in the good old days, so let's say 10 years back, we did a standard karyotype, which was the image I showed you very early on about the chromosomes. And that had a pickup rate of less than 1%. But nowadays, with the microarrays, it's roughly about 20%, um, and with the whole exome, whole genome sequencing, it's another quarter. Uh, the rates are increasing because our understanding of these genes is increasing. We're able to attribute pathogenicity much better. And also, the costs are coming down. So very soon, we are going to be talking about much um, cheaper tests to access genome sequencing. So just briefly on the microarrays, which I will talk about um, particularly in association with the copy number variants. 
So this is a technology that was introduced initially for cancer studies, but then moved on to the constitutional work, so to speak. And here you have a situation where so-called normal DNA is hybridized with the patient DNA and run through a software, and basically we're trying to pick up any deletions or duplications within the genome. So it, it's picked up through signals. And of course, there's a lot of, lot of software and lots of machinery that goes on in the process. It's quite a complicated technique. And this is the microarray pl platform. Um, this is a very old slide, so you, you can see just four slides on that platform, but now we do at least eight, um, if not more. So that's one of the reasons the costs are coming down, because we can do more per platform. And what we are hoping to pick up is um, copy number variants within the genome. But what's often difficult, and that's why a lot of work goes on behind the scenes, is interpretation of results. Because what we need to know is, is this a polymorphism? Is this a variant that doesn't carry any significance? Or is it pathogenic? And it's never that straightforward. So when we talk about genomic disorders, copy number variants, we say that this is where a DNA segment for which, for which copy number difference have been observed in more than two or more genomes. And structural changes of human genomes rather than DNA based changes. So these are detected by microarrays, the technology I talked about earlier. And any two individuals would vary more as a result of a CNV than by base pair changes. So one of the reasons copy number variants are quite difficult is because we are not essentially always able to prove causality. So, and they are quite variable even between two different individuals. So there's genetic variability, like I say, causality. So we use websites such as Decipher where lots of clinicians and lab people would deposit all their copy number variants. So we're able to look at the phenotypes and compare with our patient. Uh, online Mendelian inheritance is man, in man is another tool. Whether this has been reported before, has it been seen in normal subjects, in which case we probably discount that finding. Um, but, but even after all that, there might be rare unknown so-called so gray zone areas. Susceptibility loci, now that's a big thing in autism, ASDs, because there could be a neurosusceptibility loci that make you prone under the right genetic and environmental factors to ASD, but not, uh, not causal in themselves. Or incidental, so these are findings that we don't go looking for. So I've tried to provide some case study examples, real life examples, which illustrates why this can be a difficult area. And as I was sat here earlier, I kept thinking, oh, I should have put that particular example, I should have put this particular patient. So there's several of these that we come across. Um, so the first one is a two-year-old child that was referred to clinical genetics with my developmental delay. Um, it was probably displaying some autistic traits, but was too young to have a formal assessment. And at the time, so this is going back several years, um, we undertook a karyotype that was not particularly informative. And then we specifically talked about future genetic testing and consent was opted. So that's standard in all our um, request forms and consent that if any particular test becomes available, are they happy to consent for that? So this child was placed on the waiting list for microarrays as and when they became available. And when, it, when the service was introduced, there was, as you can imagine, a big, long waiting list. So they had to wait for a little while. And ultimately, when we did get a result, it was a chromosome 2P24 duplication, a sizable duplication, uh, including about 17 genes. But what caught our attention was this particular gene called NBAS, neuroblastoma amplified sequence gene. Um, and this is the genes, and those of you that know, neuroblastoma is a pediatric endocrine tumor. This particular gene was identified, but as a duplication. So there wasn't any literature out there to say, is this child at risk of developing neuroblastoma or not? Of course, you can't take any chances under the circumstances. So we had to explain this to the family and make sure that um, surveillance was put in place. Not what the parents were expecting. They had thought we had completed all investigations and we're never going to see them again. <coughs> so this was not what the parents were expecting, it caused a lot of anxiety. And of course, at the end of the day, it doesn't provide us an explanation for the child's phenotype. So we've got a result that we are dealing with, which doesn't explain the child's phenotype, but just give us additional dilemma to sort out. And this we come across quite a lot. This is another example, um, a six-year-old boy who was referred with ASD, speech delay, communication difficulties, and right convergence, squint. So this was the actual um, referral. And this is usually the essence of what we come across in clinical genetics practice. 
So the scene in clinic, uh, microarrays then identified a 355 kilo base deletion involving chromosome 2 piece 16.3. Now what's interesting, it's not a big deletion, so it was only small, but it was reported because it took out um, a small part of the coding region of Nurexin 1 gene. And Nurexin 1 is a high, in, high confidence autism risk gene. So of course that's why it was reported given the referent details. So we took parental samples because we need to establish whether it started for the first time in the child or is it from one of the parent. And what was interesting was when we saw them initially in clinic, parents denied any learning or social communication difficulties. They said they went to mainstream school, no problems. The father um, carried the same deletion as the child. So when we saw them back in clinic and explained the results, father then said that he did have social communication difficulties. He was initially said to have autistic traits, but back in the days, he probably didn't have a formal assessment. And that ch changes how we prove causality here, because that piece of information is quite crucial for us to try and take this further. So in the end, it was concluded that probably the deletion, given the gene involvement as well, was the cause in this family. But of course, it's complicated by the fact that this particular deletion can also be seen in normal individuals, and the explanation for that would be incomplete penetrance or variable expression. And then here's another example where perhaps we couldn't prove causality. So I saw this child a few months ago in clinic, um, three-year-old, one of known identical twins, um, referred with developmental delay, again was in the process of having an ASD assessment. Microarrays then revealed a 16P12.2 deletion. So this is another neurosusceptibility loci that we know of. When we took a detailed family history, it became apparent that mother had mild intellectual disability, had to go to um, school with lots of support. And the twin sister came along, so this three-year-old's twin sister came along, who actually presented with even more significant intellectual disability. I was quite surprised that that sibling hadn't been referred in the first instance but the referent followed subsequently. And what was interesting, the father, who was reported to have normal intelligence, no social communication difficulties, actually carried the deletion. The mother tested negative. So, like I said, it was reported as a neurosusceptibility loci. Um, when I tested the twin sister, she didn't carry that particular deletion either. So it was a minefield trying to sort it all out. <laughs> but ultimately, I think on the balance of probability, it's unlikely to be the diagnosis in this family and are now in the process of recruiting the family to whole genome sequencing studies, because I don't think we have an explanation in this family yet. So these are some of the real life examples that we do come across. So just moving on to CNVs and neuropsychiatric conditions, um, there's quite a lot of literature, particularly over the last decade, talking about CNVs um, in association with a host of neuropsychiatric conditions, including autism. And like I said earlier, we try and prove causality um, through a quite detailed um, workup, basically looking at are, is there already published literature, are any of the genes in the region already been reported in association with ASDs, um, is it a common CNV seen in the general population or not, is it de novo, has it started for the first time in the child, but of course we need to be aware that we need to explore the parental history in much more detail as illustrated by the previous example. So, of course, there's quite a lot of work that goes into trying to prove uh, or disprove causality. Factors would to consider when evaluating such a CNV, if, the, if it's not a recurrent CNV that we know and understand, is whether it's de novo or familial, looking at the size of it, um, the gene content, what are the genes in there. Is it a deletion or a duplication? Deletions are cons considered to be more significant than duplications. Um, has it been reported before? Has it been described in the general population? And this is something that we've done quite a lot of work on, the genetics world, so to speak, looking at molecular mechanisms for genomic disorders. So why do these CNVs, copy number variants, deletions or duplications have an effect? And some of the probable theories are gene dosage. So it could be that having too much or too little of the gene is having an effect. Or because of gene interruption, where exactly the um, copy number variant happens, this gene gets interrupted. Or well, there could be fusion, as you can see there, the fusion of the gene. Or position effect, there could be a regulatory element that's further upstream, that's actually having the effect. Well, this is something that we talk about quite a lot, um, and we do come across this in real life situations, unmasking of a recessive allele. 
So if you remember, I spoke about um, carry, so-called healthy carriers in autosomal recessive inheritance. And what can happen is if you're deleted for that particular region, then what it's doing is it's unmasking the mutation or the variant that's present in the other copy of the gene. So you're essentially having an autosomal recessive condition because you're deleted for the other copy of the chromosome, so to speak. So this is something we do come across where if we suspect it's a recessive condition, we do the microarrays to check if there's a deletion and then sequence the other copy of the gene. Or transvection effect where the regulatory element is only homologous chromosome. So like I say, some of the additional factors to consider would include unmasking a recessive allele are the deletions, duplications, or rearrangements of regulatory elements, and we don't understand it all. Um, complex inheritance where there could be the copy number variant, but in addition there could be a single nucleotide polymorphism, so-called SNPs, that might be having an effect as a whole. Or that possibility that these regions are recognized copy number variants in the normal population, but only in the presence of a specific genetic background so-called two-hit theory, they would manifest features of the particular condition. Or thresholding effects where perhaps a duplication is better tolerated, but if you had three times the copy or four times the copy, copy, then you are more likely to have an effect. So yes, as you can see, the CNVs in neuropsychiatric conditions, there's, there could be a thresholding effect, so you can have more than one CNV, and as the contributory effect you have in a phenotype. Or penetrance, that can be um, as demonstrated in those case studies, that can have an effect. Again, as I talked about two-hit theory, thresholding effects, etc. So it, it can be quite complicated. So in terms of CNVs in ASD, what I'd say is chromosomal deletions and duplications account for about 8 to 10 percent of ASD. It's more likely an explanation in the syndromic or syndromal ASDs. And there are some CNVs that we often come across like those on the long arm of 15, long arm of 22, long arm of 7, etc. And some, some regions are said to be hotspot for genomic instability. So you often come across recurrent micro deletions or duplications. So I've listed a few regions in there. But as I've illustrated, there can be significant limitations to attributing CNVs as the cause of ASD or the sole cause of ASD. Moving on to the single gene disorders in ASD, as I said earlier, multiple genes have been implicated in the pathogenesis of ASD. Um, I've tried to just focus on some of the common genetic disorders that we see in clinic. Um, so the examples I've got here are Fragile X syndrome, tuberous sclerosis complex, Red syndrome, Pete and Macrocephaly syndrome. But of course there's a long list of other recognizable conditions where autism is seen as an association, such as Cornelia de Lange, Williams, Angelman, Cohen, the list goes on. So Fragile X syndrome, this is said to be the most common inherited cause of intellectual disability, um, and as the name mentions, boys are more commonly affected than girls. It is said to be the commonest single gene disorder cause of ASD. Uh, and cause due to FMR1 full mutation on chromosome XQ27.3. Follows an X-linked recessive pattern of inheritance, so as you can imagine, boys more affected than girls. Uh, it's important to make this diagnosis for clinical reasons as well, uh, because we need to offer cascade screening for extended family members um, to inform recurrence risk for generations to come. But also the fragile X pre-mutation carriers, so the expansion before the full expansion, may develop fragile X ataxia syndrome, in fact, stands the record of the neurologist for ongoing follow-up. And also, female pre-mutation carriers may undergo premature menopause, so it's important for family planning to be able to make this diagnosis. And then Rett syndrome is another example where ASD is seen as a common association. This is a severe non-progressive neurodevelopmental disorder, predominantly affecting girls. Uh, boys occasionally can present, but with severe neonatal encephalopathy and often die in the first few days of life. It's caused due to mutations in MECP2, that's it on chromosome XQ28. Now as we've started to do more and more genetic testing, gone other days where we associated Rett syndrome with a severe neurodevelopmental profile, um, hand wringing, severe regression, etc. We're seeing a more broader phenotype with some children or girls more mildly affected than others. It's mainly de novo, so it starts for the first time in the girl. But of course, um, we need to be aware of germline mosaicism, and this is one of a small list of genetic conditions where the germline mosaicism risk is quite high. 
So although you probably come across an unaffected sister, we need to test her to clarify the status and give a very cautious recurrence risk in that situation. It follows an excellent dominant pattern of inheritance. And there are some of so-called atypical Rett syndrome, which is being increasingly studied, where mutations um, in CDKL5, Fox G1, and other genes are coming up. So it's still a much wider phenotype than we thought. And then tuberous sclerosis complex, um, this is a multi-system disorder with highly variable expressivity. So you could have a child that presents with infantile spasms, severe developmental delay, ASD, but you could have a parent who probably doesn't have anything, looks de novo, but actually when we check carefully, and I've had one parent, all he had as manifestation of TSC, tuberous sclerosis, was dental pits, that was it. And if you hadn't examined carefully, we wouldn't have thought of parent being affected there. In 50% of patients with um, tuberous sclerosis, they present with ASD, and the risk is said to be higher if they've got tubers in their temporal lobes and early onset infantile spasms. It's caused due to mutations in um, two of the genes that we know of, TSC1, which accounts for about 30% of patients, and TSC2, which accounts for a large proportion, about 70% of patients. These are genes that have very high pickup rates, so we often advocate testing if there's any index of clinical suspicion. Uh, it follows an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance, and as you can imagine, high proportion of caused due to new mutations, up to 60%. Um, and at the moment, there's quite a lot of trials going on looking at at least um, reducing the renal and cardiac effects of um, TS by using mTOR inhibitors such as rapamycin. So there's quite a lot of um, drug trials going on at the moment. And then moving on to P10, which is another gene, P10 uh, macrocephaly syndrome that we come across in association with ASD. So P10 is a tumor suppressor gene. And mutations in one copy of the gene causes um, autism and macrocephaly. Macrocephaly means large heads, but they are quite large. They're not just slight deviation from the normal. Um, it follows an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern again. There's a broad group of phenotypes um, that we know of. So Pete and hematoma syndromes include Cowden. Now I talked about examining external genitalia. So penile freckles is a feature, and unless we don't look for, we don't find it. So it's important to do a proper top to toe examination. And then Bani and Riley Rubalcaba syndrome, where you can have benign hydrocephalus. Um, any mutations in P10 can confer, or pathogenic variants, can confer a high cancer risk, particularly involving the breast, thyroid, endometrium, kidney. So these patients need to be kept under appropriate tumor surveillance programs. So moving on to recurrence risk um, for future pregnancies uh, in the context of ASD, it would very much depend on the etiology. So I've gone through various patterns of inheritance and it would depend on what the um, unifying diagnosis is. Where we've not been able to make a unifying diagnosis or we think this is a non-syndromic ASD with no specific genetic etiology, then we, we quote a sibling recurrence risk of 5 to 10%. But of course, the risk would be higher, up to 35%, if they have more than one affected child with ASD. If genetic diagnosis is known and confirmatory genetic testing has been done, then of course, it opens up quite a lot of options. So we're then able to offer prenatal genetic testing, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, etc. So this is the gold standard that we aim for, to be able to provide families with these options. Moving on to some ongoing research, um, as I said earlier, over the last few decades, there's been quite a lot of work trying to identify genes that are specifically involved in autism, but it does appear to be quite heterogeneous. Um, there's the Simons Foundation for Autism Research Initiative, um, based in America, that are trying to collate all this information together and compile a list of autism or high-risk autism genes, um, so I've provided the link there. And if you look at the website, the highest ranking autism candidate genes. So they say click on this chromosome and you can see it's true and across the board. So you can start with chromosome one all the way to Y and you'd find lots of genes in there that are said to be um, high risk candidate genes. And again, I was interested to look at this, the Safari gene list um, that again pulls out all the high confidence and strong candidate genes. And what's interesting is all of these genes, so ANCARD11 causes KBG, um, Arid 1B causes coffin series, P10 we've talked about, ZD5 causes a respiratory phenotype with autism, Shank 3 we know about, Syngap 1 causes an epilepsy phenotype. So all these genes are ones that we come across in clinical practice as part of syndromes, as part of dysmorphology. 
So essentially, it looks like we have this big box of genes that are important for fetal brain development. And depending on the nature of those variants or mutations that happen, it may have an effect. Just touching upon the recent advances, um, there's quite a lot of work going on into trying to identify a genetic bases. So the studies looking at generation, next generation exome and genome sequencing. So exome is just looking at the coding part of the genome, which is roughly around 2% of the genome. But genome sequencing looks at the entire lot, so the coding and non-coding part of the genome. And that's quite extensive data that we have to sift through. And that's why these projects take a while. Um, there's a Department of Health initiative called the 100,000 Genomes Project, which we are actively recruiting to to try and recruit at least 100,000 patients from the NHS to undergo genome sequencing. And when the data comes out, we are all part of the GSIP as clinical geneticists, genomic clinical interpretation partnerships, trying to decipher the data and make sense of what comes out. Um, Alyssa and I are working on some associations with uh, ASD, particularly looking at bone fragility. I touched upon the Simons Foundation work. I think overall, my reading of the topic suggests that emerging data probably is indicative that the human brain is sensitive to the, to the timing and expression of multiple genes and epigenetic changes during development, and that's why it's not as straightforward as we would have thought. So in summary, <coughs> we have provided you with an overview of genetics and various inheritance patterns, talked about syndromic versus non-syndromic ASD, particularly focusing on the syndromic um, ASD, talked about CNVs and single gene disorders um, seen in association with ASD, some ongoing research and latest advances in the field. Finally, I'd like to conclude by saying it is complex. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.